Hello, once again, I will now be giving a continuation of the introductory parts of our organic chemistry. And remember that the last time we discussed the structural formulas. Now, this is something that I told you you should always practice and get used to because otherwise you'll get lost in the myriad of structures that you will be facing in the future. But other than that, I also want to tell you that we use a lot of adjectives, a lot of words for the compounds that we will see in the future. And therefore, knowledge of your basic terminology is essential. And I will discuss here the terms that I think you have to know because if you don't, you will not understand the way we describe our structures for even simple compounds like the ones we have here. Let's start. Usually, when we use the words linear or branch or cyclic, they define the so-called skeleton or the overall appearance of the molecule. The words linear and branch can be grouped together under the word open chain because when you say open chain, it's a structure that has ends. For example, this one has two ends, the one at the left, the one at the right. This one has ends. In fact, it has three. Oh, that's, that's actually interesting. Because if something is linear, like a line, a line has two ends, right? So we can say that this is linear. But is there a line with three ends? There's none, right? So meaning, if there's a third end in an open chain, it's not part of the line. And you can say that this is a so-called branch. And therefore, these are what you call branches. So in this case, we can look at this molecule as a branched one. Now, if I actually draw this in the, you know, in the condensed formula, if I write the carbons, it would be like this. First, we recognize that this has one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. So if I draw that, it would be one, two, three, four, five, six. And you notice that they form a straight line. Therefore, the word linear just gives justice to that fact. If I draw this, how would that be? We have three carbons right there. One, two, three. And at the carbon here in the middle, we have another carbon on top. So if this is a straight line, there's something bulging out from that. And that's a branch, giving further justice to the word branch. Now, this one at the middle has no ends. It's like a polygon. It's a shape. And therefore, since it's not an open chain, we can use the word cyclic. And, well, well when you say cyclic, you, know, you tend to think, ah, oh, geometry, cyclic. It, it's like a circle. No. Of course, if we have a circle, a circle has no end, so there's like impossible, it's, it's impossible for you to know where, where the carbons are. And like this one, this is not a circle, but it's, it, it somehow re resembles, it just, let's just assume that. And since it has points, we can accurately say that this is a carbon, this is a carbon, 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 carbon. So those are what you call cyclic compounds, those that take the shape of polygons. Here, carbon, 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 straight chain, that's linear. How about this? Carbon, carbon, carbon. But look at this one. This CH3 is enclosed in a parenthesis. And remember, I taught you before that in, in the previous video for structural formulas, if this is a parenthesis, this is something belonging to the carbon before it. So if I write that in the, you know, in the expanded version, we have how many carbons? One, two, three. And at carbon number two, there is a CH3 on top. And actually, you have to realize this is the exact structure as this one. So, this is also branched. In fact, this structure and this structure are the same thing. Okay? Now, how about this? This is actually linear. Now, you may say, how, how did that become linear? It, you, know, it, it, you know, if it's linear, then why did it curve up? And the thing is, remember that carbon, carbon, single bonds, and you know, everything that we're seeing here are single bonds anyway, are flexible. And once more, remember, in geometry, a line is something that has two ends. How many ends does this have? One, and then two. So we're still conforming to that principle. Now, how about this? You can just use the definition that I used before. So how many ends does, does this molecule have? One, two, and then we have another here. 
3n. There's no line with 3n, so this must be branched. Or you can just imagine, if this is the straight line, then there's something going out from that line, okay, or that linear structure, so that's a branch. I hope that clarifies linear versus branch. For cyclic, we have additional things to deal with because there are a lot of terms and, you know, this might be daunting at first, but we have to face it. And the good part is it's not that difficult. First, in, in terms of number of ring members, it's, it's just like how many atoms are there in the ring? It's like how many points are there in a polygon? Like how many points are there in a square? Four. How many points in a pentagon? Five. And that's exactly what we're doing. How many points are there in a pentagon? Five. So that means that this has five ring members. I just write RM, five ring members. How about this? It looks like a hexagon and that's six. So six ring members. You may ask, do I include nitrogen? Of course, that's part of the ring. Okay, so we still include that. This looks like a hexagon also, six ring members. This one looks a pen like a pentagon, five ring members. Now, how, what if I have these? Now, for the first time, we encounter what you call a bicyclic compound. This one is also a bicyclic compound. When you say bicyclic, bi means two, so that means two rings, exactly. Two rings, one, two, two rings. So meaning, all the structures that we have encountered so far at the bottom are only one ring system, so we can call this, 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 and this as monocyclic. Now, if I have a bicyclic system, you may describe them individually, like how many ring members do I have here? Well, this one has six ring members, this one has six. This one has four, this one has four. Very easy. Now, another thing that we need to know are the words carbocyclic and heterocyclic. By the way, carbocyclic also can be called homocyclic, especially when we compare the prefix homo to hetero. Well, homo means same, and that means that all this, the ring atoms are the same molecule, or same atom, I mean, carbon. So if this one is carbon, 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 all are the same, that is homocyclic. Or since all the atoms there are the same in the case that they are all carbon, you can also call this as carbocyclic. That's why homo and carbocyclic are synonymous. How about this? Well, of course, nitrogen is not carbon, and that's different, different hetero. So the moment you have an atom in the ring, in the ring, and let me repeat that, inside the ring, that is not carbon, like nitrogen or oxygen, you call this as heterocyclic compounds. This one is homo because all are carbons, right? All here are carbons also, so this is homocyclic. Now, it may be a good question to ask, how about in this case, this ring has carbons, all of these are carbons, and just to you know, make sure that you see everything, I'm going to erase the details. So, right, because this one is all carbons, so this part is carbocyclic, but the right side has a nitrogen. In that case, the heterocyclic part wins. So, this entire thing is heterocyclic. So, meaning, even if I have a cyclic portion, carbocyclic or homo part there, we don't care. The entire thing is heterocyclic. Additional examples. So, this one is bicyclic, six-membered, five-membered. Since there's a different atom, everything is heterocyclic. How about this? Only one ring, so it's monocyclic. How many members? It looks like a square. So that's four membered ring, four ring members. And since there's a different atom, that is heterocyclic. How about this? How many rings? One, two, three, four. So we can use the prefix tetra, meaning four. So that's tetracyclic. All the atoms are carbon, even if I try to identify them. So that's carbocyclic or homocyclic. And the ring members, hexagon 6, then another one, then another one. This one is a pentagon, so 5, 6, 6, 6, 5. How about this? Three, three rings, right? With 6, 6, 6 ring members. So this is tricyclic, tri meaning 3. And because this has sulfur and nitrogen, those are not carbons, the entire ring is a heterocyclic compound. How about this? This is a little different from this one, and this one is, the only difference is that this one is heterocyclic because of the nitrogen. Notice that this now becomes carbon, so this is homocyclic. Now, 
I expect that, I may be wrong here, but I expect that some will answer that this is heterocyclic simply because they saw this oxygen. That's wrong. Remember, this oxygen is not inside the ring. This is the ring, right? And the atoms are carbon, 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 and carbon. And that's what matters in differentiating homo or heterocyclic definitions. Now, another important term is the word saturation. Basically, when we say saturated, it means that all the carbon-carbon bonds are single. In the case of unsaturated, there's the presence of double or triple bonds. So, for example, I have this molecule right here, this straight chain. Not only do we describe this as linear, but also we describe this as saturated. How about this? And this is an example you've seen in a previous video. Remember, this is propene, and is this saturated or unsaturated? Of course, it's unsaturated because there's the presence of a double bond. But before I proceed, I want to clarify this. Many people actually don't know the context of the word saturated or unsaturated. They just say, all carbons, bonds are single, saturated. There's a double bond, unsaturated, but you know, what does saturated really mean? In the dictionary, and uh, of course this is not verbatim, when you say something saturated, it is filled up. Filled up with what? I mean, why out of all the words we use the word that means filled up when we say that all carbon bonds are single? And that means, actually, saturated means filled up with hydrogens. What does that even say? Or what does that even mean? For example, this carbon. Does this carbon have a double bond or a triple bond? No, right? So we can say that this carbon is saturated, meaning it has the most number of hydrogens. Indeed, how many hydrogens does it have? One, two, three. How about this, uh, this carbon? This is a double bond, right? And therefore, we describe this carbon as unsaturated. And by the way, since we have saturated and unsaturated, in the case of this one, the entire compound is unsaturated so this will the unsaturation will supersede the saturation but let's go back to the word unsaturated why is this not when you say unsaturated it means not filled with H and is that true how many hydrogens does this have one two so this has two car, uh, hydrogens this one has this is two let me change that this is two this is 3, which has more hydrogens. Of course, 3, the saturated one. You see, the reason why we only have 2 hydrogens for the unsaturated part is the double bond. I mean, remember this. If I actually tried to draw a third hydrogen, how many bonds would this carbon have? That's right, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And that's not allowed. So, if ever we have a double bond, that is implying that we need to get rid of one hydrogen. And therefore, since... We don't have the most hydrogens possible. This is not any more saturated. Or, in other words, also, turning back that back around, if I remove the double bond, I could actually use that to add a hydrogen. So, in fact, by removing an unsaturation, we are actually making a compound more saturated. Now, that's very confusing at the start, I understand, but you can try to replay this part several times and probably will you will get the hang of what I'm trying to say. Now, let us try to uh, classify these compounds in terms of saturation. All you need to do is to look at the double bond. If there is none, saturated. If there is, or a triple bond, but I don't have a triple bond here, but, but if you have a double bond, that's unsaturated. This one, linear, no, no, single, uh, no double bond, so saturated. This one has a double bond, unsaturated. This one has double bonds, so it's unsaturated. Single bonds, everything here, saturated. There are double bonds, unsaturated. All bonds here are single. Oh, by the way, this is not the letter X. This is a compound. This is carbon in the middle, which has four carbons attached to it. No double bonds, saturated. With double bonds, unsaturated. With double bonds, unsaturated. Now, if we have an unsaturated compound and, uh, and you have two or more double bonds, we can use the words conjugated, cumulated, or isolated. When you say, let me use, let's go to isolated first. Isolated means separated from one another. 
That means that the double bonds are separated and to be technical, to be accurate, by at least, at least two single bonds. So you, you can have two, three, four, five single bonds in between that's isolated. For example, this compound is isolated. Why? This is the double bond. This is the double bond. How many bonds in the middle that are single? One, two. Also at the top, one, two. So since you have two bonds separating them, that already counts as isolated. When you say cumulated, cumulated, somehow, you know, if you add the word or, or the prefix accumulated, so the double bonds have gathered at the same area. So that means that you have these two double bonds attached to a similar carbon at the middle, just like this one. This carbon has two double bonds. They gather here at the middle. So we can say that this is cumulated. And this is isolated. Conjugated is like a perfect balance because in, in conjugated, there is just one single bond in the middle of the double bonds. For example, this is a double bond, this is a double bond, there is only one single bond in the middle, so this is an example of a conjugated compound. And uh, a very convenient definition other than the one that we just used right now for conjugated is the word alternating. That is, alternating double and single bonds. Because that's right. Look at this. We have here double, single, double. And then I could add another single, then another double, then another single, then another double. And that would be alternating. A perfect example also is this one, which is very popular in organic chemistry. This is called benzene. This is also conjugated because as you can see, this is double, single, double, single, double, single. Then how about this one? Because if you look at this downward, it's double, single, double. It's conjugated. If you look at this from this one to this one, it's double, single, single, double. It's isolated. In the case of this one, conjugated actually wins, not isolated. Because there's something very special in conjugated systems or arrangements that cumulated or isolated arrangements do not do. Of course, that is a little advanced for the moment, so I will reserve that for the future. But all you need to know is that when you have alternating double and single bonds, that is conjugated. So once again, these are the terms that I want you to be familiar with. We will be utilizing them for all, or if not, almost all of the succeeding discussions.